Hey everybody, welcome back to another live stream from Deep Astronomy. It's JWST week. Can you believe it? We're finally here. Please let me know if you can hear me okay. I think I've got all my audio stuff ready. As we all know, Deep Astronomy streams are known for their smooth technological happenings. <laughs> we know very well how catastrophic all my live streams go. Uh Busy week. How's your sphincter muscles doing? You guys holding it in? <laughs> I'm sorry, but how else do you explain what we're going to be up against this week? This is it. This is the culmination of over 20, 30 years of work culminating in a launch coming up this Friday, 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time. I mean, what is that? One o'clock UT, something like that. Um, it's happening. The James Webb Space Telescope, for those of you who don't know, is scheduled to launch. And the last news I got from it was that as of on Friday, the uh, European Space Agency had closed up the spacecraft in with fairings on the rocket and it is now sitting in an enclosed uh rocket environment it's been fueled up it's got the hydrazine fuel in it that it's going to be needing for its mission the only thing that remains i think is they're moving it out to the launch pad this week so any delays that happen people have been asking me do i really think this is going to launch and i mean whether it's going to launch friday or saturday or sunday may be a question, but it is going to launch very, very soon. If you think about it, NASA has finished all of its part in building it. It's been tested. It's been loaded onto the rocket. It's basically out of their hands at this point until the thing launches. So any delays that happen, I think are going to be due to the rocket itself. You know how sometimes maybe weather, the high winds will be too much, or they, you know, there's a, there's a glitch in the countdown and they wait and figure out what's going on with the valve or something but that's all on the rocket and not due to jwst so this is all in the hands of the european space agency folks isa ariane space ariane rocket mark 5 is being used to launch this thing so we're going to talk about this today i've got streams today thursday and friday thursday is going to be a more therapeutic one where we sit together and and sort of commiserate on how we're going to get through this and how to get ourselves mentally prepared. Um, but today, when I was thinking about what I want to do uh, for a discussion, I was thinking about doing something else. You know, I have a lot of other live streams I've got planned, but really, I can't think about anything else but JWST. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to talk about JWST. And for, and for fact, we're, in fact, we're going to compare it with Hubble. So what I'll do is I'll, as soon as I show you this really cool video that NASA just posted today, um, I will uh, talk about what we can expect from JWST, how it compared to Hubble. It's funny because you know how I, I usually make these uh, <laughs> these PowerPoints that I, that I present to everybody. I was writing out a PowerPoint and I'm going, what the hell am I doing? I'm not going to sit here and go through 30 years of Hubble discoveries. I'm going to be here all day. So I'm gonna we'll 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 talk about this. I got a few questions. Julian, you're here. I see you made it. Uh, you, I'm going to get to your question in just a minute. He asked a question via email. He's my friend from Canada, uh, joining a, a stream live, and he's asked a pretty good question. I'll I'll get to that too. Also, you guys answer or uh, ask questions. I will join the Discord server in just a minute. I haven't joined it yet because I've been pushing a lot of buttons and I didn't get a time to join on the Discord. But if you go into the live stream voice channel on our Discord server, I will patch you in and you can talk as if we are in a call-in type show. Uh, and I'll talk to you there. I'll be joining in just a minute, but right now I'm not joined up. I want to start with this. Saw this today, was posted today. It's only got 25,000 views, but, you know, it's pretty cool. Let's check this out. We have uncovered wonders undreamt by our ancestors who first speculated on the nature of those wandering lights in the night sky. to 
to the stars. But we continue to search. We can't help it. A central element of the human future lies far beyond the Earth. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal. Let's do that again because I screwed it up. We have uncovered wonders undreamt by our ancestors who first speculated on the nature of those wandering lights in the night sky. We've crossed the solar system and sent ships to the stars. But we continue to search. We can't help it. Essential element of the human future lies far beyond the earth. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal. That is well done. Let me. In December 2008. Oops, let's not do that. All right. Here, by the way, is the link to that in case. It's just on NASA's uh, website. Let my cursor go. There it is. Here you go, guys. There's the, hopefully that went to everybody. Um, <clears throat> so that was good. Um, uh, <laughs> just posted today. Don't worry, Hans, it's going to get a lot more views than that. You know, P NASA gets a lot of crap for JWST. Some of it's deserved, but let me tell you something. NASA has got the balls the size of Jupiter to try something like this. Think about what's being done here. We are launching a telescope that is the largest ever constructed and put into orbit. This is the biggest thing we've put in space ever, as far as the space telescope goes. Yeah, it's taken a long time to build. Yes, it's taken a long time to uh, uh, invent things to need that weren't in, that didn't exist before, and to get all this put together. But I mean, this is a gutsy move. After all of this time, all of the attention and all of the money, 300, I think, single points of failure, a point of failure, a single point of failure is where if it happens, the whole mission's gone. So this is a gutsy move. And I hats off to NASA for doing it. People say it's a conservative organization and that it, you know, it doesn't like to take risks. This puts all that crap to rest right now. Uh, this is a gutsy, ballsy move. I don't think anybody is better at risk mitigation or risk management than NASA. Um, I, I, I just, I'm in awe of them wanting to do this for the entire world to see. 
Yes, the risks are high. Yes, a lot is on the line. But there is there is also a lot to be gained from doing something like this. As, you know, as the as, as the narration said, let's find a goal worthy of this, right? I mean, that using Carl Sagan uh, is is spot on for this. It was a beautifully done uh, trailer, and it's inspiring. And I. I, I got nothing but mad respect for NASA having to put up with this or to put this up, <laughs> put up with this. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about NASA as an organization, it makes a lot of seemingly strange things, a lot of seemingly strange decisions. Uh, certainly with respect to communication, I've been involved with a lot of the communication aspects of NASA and it's been very frustrating about as far as the messaging that they want to do. But this is the kind of... They, they have good reason for it, right? They, this is the kind of thing they want to, uh, con they can control, so they will control it. You know, the messages that they send out. Um, and so I just want to, I just want to remind everybody that this is a ballsy move. The fact that it's even being considered at all is amazing. Mark my words, this is the last time this is going to happen. W first is the next thing up coming up. This is not going to, it's nowhere near in the complexity of a mission as the James Webb Space Telescope is. Uh, and um, the risks are so great on this mission that even the decadal survey has said, and we talked about that during our decadal survey stream, they don't want to see missions done like this anymore. They, there's too big of a gap between the uh, New Horizons class, Europa Clipper class NASA missions and these great observatory missions they're calling it. This is one of the great observatories uh, out there. And, they, and there's a too big of a gap. We're talking of between 500 million for say the, a trip to Pluto or, or Europa up to billions of dollars for these kinds of things. So they're, they're advocating and NASA will probably do this, redo how they decide what the kinds of missions come forth in the future. You won't see a mission this big in your lifetime again, at least not on the science directorate part of it. There are two, NASA, for those of you who don't know, has been, is basically split up into two big chunks. There's the human spaceflight section. That's the part that deals with Artemis going to the moon, the gateway, the ISS, um, the human spaceflight, you know, putting astronauts into orbit. All of that is on the human spaceflight side. And then there is the science directorate. It's run by Thomas Serbukin and that's the part that has all takes care of all the Mars rovers. It uh, sends us, you know, the the solar probes, uh, Parker Solar Probe, Stereo, Solar Dynamics Observatory, as well as uh, all of the space telescopes. Hubble falls under that. JWST will fall under this. W first later, or I'm sorry, um, NGRST uh, will be following that as well. It's all under the umbrella of the Science Directorate. And I don't think what happens in one really affects the other in terms of funding. Another big criticism for, for JWST, and then I'm going to get to the meat of what I want to talk about here, is that there is some sense that the JWST mission has taken away science from somewhere else so that this could get built. And that's really not how NASA funding works. It is true that in the, toward the end of the mission, the last couple of years, when there was these last bit of... Con, uh, of um, uh, cost overruns that required Congress, I think it was 2017 or 2018, I can't remember now, they had to ask Congress for more money because they had reached the cap for this mission. Um, there was, at that point, NASA was pulling the purse strings pretty tight and some things were delayed, but not canceled. Um, so there's a lot, and the reason I say this is there's a lot of astronomers out there who are like grumbling and bitching, especially the ground-based ones. Well, I don't know why we hope you guys are happy. JWST is sucking up all the money from NASA. And it's not. It is it it, it the way things you come up with a you come up with a mission and NASA decides to do it, it gets done by and large, with the exception of uh I think um W first was canceled once, but not because of JWST. It was canceled for other reasons. They didn't have the the technology and they were so embroiled uh with so so many other things that they they canceled w first but then along came nro with those hubble chassis and w first is back up again so even that wasn't wasn't canceled so i i, I want to push back a little on this thinking that you know because jwst costs so much nothing else got done and i i, I dispute that 
um, because there are, you know, the way in which NASA decides to fund things is is not like that. Well, let's take Peter to pay Paul, that kind of thing. They they have their own missions and their own funding once they get started. Um, now, there may be decisions, I don't know, I'm not privy to this stuff, where a mission may not get started at all because of missions that are already on their plate. But I think that's more of a science directorate issue for giving NASA more money as a whole, as opposed to blaming JWST for everybody's budget faults. And let's remind ourselves, let's get a little bit of perspective here. NASA funding, as Neil deGrasse Tyson is always fond of telling us, what is it? One half of one penny or something of every tax dollar goes to NASA. And we get quite a bit for our money on that, right? You want to... Maybe instead of another aircraft carrier, you build another space telescope. Maybe that's something you can talk about uh, as far as talk about, you know, budgetary constraints. So I want to push back on that idea from astronomers that who say this. I've been to plenty of meetings back in the uh, early 2000s where I was hearing this a lot, you know, when especially when I took a job at the Institute, I heard that. Heard that. So anyway. Um, all right. I am monitoring things. And I'm looking at chat. I'm streaming on. Oh wow, I've got quite a few people on on Twitch. So Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, and um, that YouTube thing. So I'm on that, and I'm looking at all your chats. Uh, and I could do. I can do this. So um, a flyby is. This is from Charlie. A flyby is interesting and very useful. However, it collects data on its target for a few days. The space observatories collect data for years. That's true. Um, but sometimes. Uh, that's the best way to explore a planet. Voyagers 1 and 2, Pioneer before them, New Horizons, and all these other place, things that are doing flybys. New Horizons, I think, was one. It was, one it was an Explorer-class mission, $500 million-ish. Not bad for the money, right? I, I think it's worth spending. So, But yeah, you're right. Space observatories do collect things for many years. So I want to talk about... I'm going to talk about JWST again on Thursday, and I'm going to talk about it again on Friday. So at the launch time, so stick with me on all of these things. If you want to talk about something specific, bring it up in the chat and I'll be around uh, to do that. Um, oh, Christian, you're out there. Um, also, Christian, I don't know, we may be streaming together at some point. And if that's true, then I'm, we'll, I'll am i be happy to do that um, with you as well. Um, so if you want to stream on Friday together, let's do it. Or, um, you can also join the one on Thursday. Hell, you can even join the one now if you want. I'll send you a link. Um, but let me let me get to my spiel. I was make as I said earlier. I was uh, making up slides, and then I decided, what the hell am I doing slides for? NASA's got all the stuff I need. So let's talk about JWST versus Hubble. No, it's not going to be some kind of rap battle thing. So don't get used. Don't get thinking that's going to happen. Um, I want to talk about what Hubble is has has. Uh, some of the things in which Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope, how do they compare? What are the differences? And what can we, and then I'm going to finish it. What are some of the things Hubble showed us? And then we'll talk about what some of the things that we hope to get from the James Webb Space Telescope. All right. So the biggest difference between Hubble, let me scroll down here a little bit. Let's take a look. This is pretty cool. Let me uh, get this thing going. And I think I can do this and you'll see it. All right. So here is a comparison of the two telescopes. Hubble is on the right, in case you didn't know, and JWST is on the left. The biggest thing here are the mirror diameters are highlighted here. And there's an, <laughs> I love that little silhouette guy they have. He's like standing there going, oh, I'm looking at rotating telescopes uh, above my head. So <laughs> hmm, look at that. <laughs> Sorry, it caught up in the details. Uh, but JWST has got a bigger primary mirror. Uh, six and a half meters for JWST versus two and a half for Hubble. Hubble's about the size. Hubble's primary is a little bit bigger than a person. Uh, and you're looking at 20 some odd plus feet uh, of primary uh, collecting area for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, they're also kind of similar in size. Um, they... Uh, they always compare Hubble to a school bus and JWST to a tennis court. 
Um, these are big things. These are both very, very large. The The Hubble Space Telescope was designed to be built and, and deployed, or sorry, travel and deployed on a space shuttle. And it filled up every inch of that cargo bay on the space shuttle. It was also limited by where it could go uh, because of the space shuttle. So it's in high, low Earth orbit, um, the highest orbit that the space shuttle could reach. And that's where it's sitting now. So um, the, the other big difference between these two telescopes, in addition to their size, is the uh, primary mirrors. Here, you, oh, well, let me just show you this. Then. The, this is the primary mirror size. Here's another graphic of it. I've put this on the back of the JWS t shirt uh, to show um, in a less spinny fashion the, the changes in those sides. But the other big difference is going to be in wavelength. Um, here is. Uh, a wavelength range that Hubble will see versus what uh, JWST will see. JWST is primarily a, well, it, it is exclusively an infrared telescope. It looks at no other wavelengths, but it is its instruments will see everywhere from 0.6 microns out to about 28 microns. Uh, that's in the near infrared and the mid infrared. And that is where JWST will be observing. Hubble uh, can look from the ultraviolet through optical and in the near infrared. Uh, so those are the big differences between Hubble and um, and JWST. Um, they the Hubble it says here the Hubble can observe a small portion of the infrared spectrum from about 0.8 to two and a half microns, uh, but its primary capabilities are in the ultraviolet and visible parts of the spectrum. And so here's an example up here of a picture. Um, of the Carina Nebula, where on the right you can see the visible light um, version of this nebula, and on the, I'm sorry, on the left side and on the right side you can see uh, what that same object looks like in the infrared using uh, wide field camera three. So it's quite a bit different, but look at the number of stars that can be seen on the right that cannot be seen on the left. The infrared light of these stars is able to travel through the gas and dust so that we can see them. That is crucial for James Webb uh, abilities. People people say all the time, why are we so concerned about the infrared? What's so great about the infrared? And I've told you many times on my stream that when I was just starting out, um, this was a bit, I was I was in college in the mid '90s, and my instructors all said the future of of astronomy is in the infrared, and the reason for that is that all of the interesting stuff, the science, the science that we want to do in cosmology today, is is being that that information is visible primarily in the infrared. It isn't true if you're looking at active galactic nuclei or black holes, things like that, but it is true if you're looking for th things in the early universe. So, um, so, so looking at the infrared is vital. All telescopes that NASA builds and launches and puts in space are driven by one thing. And that is the science requirements. What do you want it for? That's the first question you have to be able to answer for a mission to be up in space. For Hubble, that question was, we want to know the expansion rate of the universe very accurately. That was the number one thing they wanted Hubble to be able to do when they launched it in 1990. They had that answer about a year or so after they launched the thing. So they got their science requirements. So they had others, but that was the primary one. And then we spent 30 years learning all kinds of other really cool things using the Hubble Space Telescope. But that's what got it built. That's what got it justified, paid for, and launched was that. And the science requirements for JWST, the big science requirement is they want to look at the very first stars and the very first galaxies in the early universe. Not among the first stars and galaxies. They want to see the first stars that ever shone in the universe. <laughs> and to do that, they had to build JWST. And it had to be in the infrared. And the reason why, it's they have to, because as most of you already know, the universe is expanding. And it's accelerating as it is expanding. Wow, thank you guys for, wow, wow, that's really generous. Thank you guys very much. I want me to just take, thank you, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you also, um, Curtis. I appreciate that. Um, let me read, I'll read your question. Uh, let me just finish what I'm saying. And then I will read your question. Okay. So, um, um, 
Oh, the universe is, ex is expanding. This is why I shouldn't read chat while I'm talking. Uh, the universe is expanding and it's accelerating as it expands. And as the universe is getting bigger, when the very first stars to ever be born were super giant stars, very large, hundreds and thousands of times the mass of the sun, millions of times. And they shone primarily, they were very blue, very hot, and they shone primarily in the ultraviolet. They only live about a million years and they died. Uh, so to, and those, so those stars were primarily emitting light in the ultraviolet. The universe expanded, stretched space time for 13, 14, let's say 12 billion years. If you go to a billion years for the first stars, uh, 12 billion, some odd years, the universe expanded and it caused the photons from those stars to redshift in to right now, when they finally reach our solar system, those ultraviolet photons are now infrared photons. So if we want to see these stars, that's where we have to look. Not in the ultraviolet where they initially started, not in the visible because they've already redshifted past that. They're in the infrared, and that's where we need to look if we want to see the very first stars. Why infrared? Why not radio? Why not further down? Well, the, the universe is expanding at a rate that Hubble helped measure. And it's accelerating. It's getting faster all the time. And the age of the universe, 13 some odd billion years, and the expansion rate of the universe means that those have been stretched and redshifted to the um, infrared part of the spectrum. So that's why it's infrared. And that's why uh, it's going to be, uh, it was designed the way it was, JWST. So why don't we service HST to keep it longer? There is still more to do. We could also deploy a habitat near it so we can keep going. Um, Curtis, man, nobody wants that more than me, but you know that Hubble's been sub serviced five times and it was designed to be deployed by the space shuttle and serviced by the space shuttle by people. Now it's theoretically possible that we could send robots up there to upgrade it and, and, uh, fix it. But you, this is one of those things where you do kind of have to prioritize your money. Is it money well spent to, to develop capability for human beings to get up to Hubble minus the space shuttle because the space shuttle program's dead now? Uh, so presumably, I don't know, a, a Falcon 9 or something to get us up there and work on it, grab hold of it, work on it, fix it, repair it, replace components and come back down or and replenish gyros and all of that kind of stuff? Or is it better to put your money in a brand new telescope? It's kind of like when you own a really old car that, um, you know, it needs a new transmission and a new engine and all that kind of stuff. And you're thinking, wow, this car's got like 500,000 miles on it. Is it, should I, should I bother getting a new engine and transmission in it for whatever it's going to cost to do that? Or should I just buy a new car? Um, we've all faced some stuff like that. And sometimes it makes sense to get a new engine and transmission. But the, in this case, the the rewards don't outweigh the risks. We need to do more science than we're currently able to do with Hubble. Hubble can continue to take great pictures and it can do a lot of great science with the 2.4 meter mirror, but we can do better. And so I admit, I mean, a good case could be made, maybe not $9 billion more money uh, for JWS2, but I think the science will be worth it. it. It's really hard to put a value on the things that you're getting back for your money. Are we getting $9 billion worth of science out of this? I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I would say, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, for me personally, yeah, it's $9 billion. It's well, money well spent, but you know, not everybody would agree. So it's hard to put a dollar value on that kind of stuff, but Hubble will be around until the mid 2030s before its orbit decays to the point where it might start burning up. It's still in operation. They just got it back up again. So Hubble is still um, taking data. It's fully science operational right now, 31 years on. Um, so um, all of these things that you're suggesting, deploying a habitat uh, so we can keep it going would be great. But ask yourself, are we anywhere near this? Do we have any kind of capability to do this? This isn't NASA's fault. You know, we have prioritized, you know, NASA has been trying to get Artemis going for quite a while, getting back to the moon, but let's face it, NASA gets the, the game, the, 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 the game changed on it all the time. 
right? So, you know, the, the goalposts keep moving with NASA. Go to the moon by the end of this decade. Don't go to the moon by the end of this decade. Go to Mars instead and build the gateway. Don't build the gateway. You know, every single politician has their way of wanting to deal with NASA. And so NASA just builds the things that almost anybody's going to want. But it's slow. It's excruciatingly slow. And we're nowhere near ready to do any kind of repair on the Hubble Space Telescope. My prediction is that there will be a company, there are several out there, who were, who are already working on satellite capture and uh, repair uh, or and deorbit capabilities. These will all be done remotely. It won't be done by people. They will launch up these satellites that will go to a specific satellite, repair it, deorbit it, or move it higher, replenish it, fill it up with gas, whatever. That company, whoever, whichever one it happens to be, I don't think SpaceX is interested in this, um, will be able to grab onto the end of the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, push it up into a higher orbit so that it doesn't crash down into Earth, buying us more time. That's what I think will happen. I think by then, by the mid-2030s, we'll have that capability, and they will push it up higher and give us more time to get up there. I would be very surprised if they let Hubble burn up in the atmosphere. I think that by the 2030s, when this becomes a real issue, uh, it will be, uh, we'll have a fix for it. Um, I don't know if I can find, I'll try to real quickly find, let's see, Hubble in space, which is, um, there's this particular picture I'm looking for. Um, here it is. I don't know if you can see it, but um, this is from SpaceX. This, um, on the on the very back, let me let me make this bigger. Let me see if I can do this here. Let me say make this bigger. Uh, right here, on the back of Hubble, you can see my pointer is a ring. John Grunsfeld put that there, and that ring is just sitting there. It's just attached to the bottom, and it was designed so that you know a multi-use arm could grab a hold of it and uh, push it or do something with it, grab on it so that they can work on it. So that was done during the last servicing mission in 2009. And um, so that, oops, where's my, all right. So anyway, that, that, um, that's possible. I think that using that ring somebody could go up and uh, cause it to um, cause it to uh, uh, maybe get it up into a higher orbit so we don't lose it. Okay. So I don't think we're going to lose Hubble uh, over this. Uh, I really think we'll manage to save it. Okay. So back to this. Um, so the wavelength range of the James Webb Space Telescope is in the infrared. Uh, the um, uh, Hubble was designed from UV all the way down through the near infrared. Here's another picture of wide field of WIFPIC, the WIFPIC camera 2 from Hubble in visible light and the WIFC3 in IR. This is uh, this is the monkey head nebula. Uh, and again, you can see the kind of difference. So JWST is going to be producing images like this on the right. Now, you could easily argue, well, it's not as pretty. And, and because it's not as pretty, it's not as good of a scope. Uh, but again, look at the stars that are coming through this gas and dust that is not coming through in the visible light. The visible light, it's cool to make pretty pictures in, but it is not all that useful scientifically. And so that's why uh, this thing, again, is why it's in the infrared. So let me scroll through. Here we go. The ubiquitous unit of space telescopes nowadays is the tennis court. We measure space telescopes in units of tennis courts. How many tennis courts big is it? <laughs> I don't know why we do this, but we do. Anyway, JWST is one tennis court in size. Uh, so, and by comparison, Hubble is about three quarters of a tennis court in size. Um, and here's another big difference, the orbit. Oh man, this orbit. The Hubble Space Telescope uh, is in orbit around Earth, uh, just in high the highest orbit that the space shuttle could go. JWST is going out to something called an L2 point. Now, what is an L2 point? Let me see if I can show you this. I found this uh, uh, animation on on YouTube. Um, let me give let me give a credit to this guy. Uh, this is the YouTube user I found this from. Um, let me see if I can get this. Hold on just a sec. Um, so he, every so here are, is a, an animation of something called Lagrange points. Any 
any two bodies in orbit around each other, whether it's the Earth around the sun, whether it's the moon around the Earth, they all have these things called Lagrange points. And there are five of them around any two bodies. Now, this animation is showing the Lagrange points around the Earth and the sun. I'm sorry, the uh, Earth and the moon. I'll uh, put that back up in again in a minute, but let me show you this uh, picture. This uh, are, is a picture of the Lagrange points of the Earth and the sun. Here's the Earth. There's the sun. Here are the five Lagrange points. It makes kind of a cross. And again, this is for any two objects in orbit around each other. And these, all five of these objects, all five of these Lagrange, Lagrange points follow the Earth as it goes around the sun and at the spots where they're located. L1 is always right here as it goes around the sun. L2 is always behind the Earth as it goes around the sun. L3 is way on the other side of the sun. And then L4 and L5 are two points off to the wings. These are the areas where a lot of people are thinking these Trojan asteroids, when they don't think it, they know it. The Trojan asteroids, so-called Trojan asteroids, are, are, are building up and kind of coagulating in those areas uh, in orbit around the Earth, in Earth's orbit. Uh, so and, and so this animation that I was showing you, uh, while it shows the, the moon um, going around the Earth, the Earth is in the center here. Um, but you can see all of the Grange points going around the, uh, the moon as it goes. So imagine instead of that being the earth and the sun is there and that where the moon is, is where, um, is where, uh, the earth is. And the L2 point is behind the earth. See how the L2 point follows the earth as it goes around the sun. Let me make this bigger. I'm going to put out the video credit. That's the user I got it from. So you can see the uh, you can see the L2 point following the Earth or following the Moon in this case, but this will be doing it with the Earth uh, as it goes around the Sun. These are Lagrange points in motion. Why go to L2? L2 is a gravitationally unstable region. Actually, I, that's what I learned from John Ehrenberg, the chief. Uh, uh, um, engineer on on JWST, it turns out that that is a good place to put space telescopes because not only does it follow the Earth around the uh, sun in the orbit in the same spot, but it's also, it, it keeps it kind of cleared out. There aren't any, um, like, micrometeor the chance of micrometeoroids or small rocks hitting it are, are small because it's kind of a cleared out area. As opposed to L2 and L, I'm sorry, L L4 and L5, these two points off to the left and right of it, uh, things tend to aggregate there. But L2, things are kind of repelled. At least that's what I was told. Um, and so that's one. That's, that was those were two reasons that they um, chose the L2 point. The third reason. So it follows the Earth as it goes around the Sun. It will point away from the solar system as it does that. It won't be pointing towards the Earth, I'm sorry, towards the sun at all because it's very sensitive. You don't be looking at the sun with a with a six and a half meter telescope. And you also, it needs to be cold because this is a mid-infrared instrument because it goes all the way out to the 25 micron range. It has to be cold. The cameras, the sensors, all of that stuff has to be cold, so cold that you need to go, you need to have these big giant tennis court uh, sized um, uh, heat reflectors to keep the heat away uh, so that you can get down to 30 Kelvin, three zero. That's cold. 30 degrees above absolute zero is the temperature this thing is going to operate at, which is amazing. All right, that is really cold. So it's another reason it's going out to L2. The Earth is too bright. If we tried to put this thing in orbit around Earth, this thing would work. It would first of all it would get cold enough, and second of all, because the temperature swings would be too wide, and it would be constantly in danger of being, you know, uh, uh, light from the Earth or, or anywhere near it to to just wash out the images. The background, sky background, will be what you know, the, the background, I should say, uh, would be too much. And so, you need it out there, a million miles away is where L two is, a million and a half kilometers is where they're going to put it. So. It follows the Earth around the sun. It's gravitationally unstable enough to push out micrometeorites and, and smaller pieces of things that can hit the spacecraft. It's relatively clear. It allow, it, it's uh, it, easy communication to Earth because always we're in line of sight of, the, of L2. We can always 
be in contact with the telescope and we can get it cold enough to re re reach the detector sensitivities that JWST will be operating under. So all of those things are why we're going to L2. It's going to take a month to get there. I'll talk about that more on Saturday, on Friday, on uh, Thursday. But right now, uh, I'm, I'm comparing this with Hubble. So that's where it's going to go out to the L2 point. And um, so um, one more thing I want to compare with Hubble uh, is how far back this thing is going to look. Let me see if I can embiggen this. Um, so the furthest, this is a graph of the Big Bang on the right, and there's this expanding universe going off to the left. The age of the universe is at the bottom axis here. The modern universe is at 13.7 billion years. This is where all our galaxies are. We live in the Stelliferous era of the universe, and um, where all the stars and, and galaxies are shining brightly, fully formed and mature. Um, but the further back we look, the bigger our telescopes are, the further back in time we can see. And right now, the Hubble Space Telescope, the farthest back it's ever seen, has been quantified by its deep fields. It has taken many, many deep fields over the years, starting with 96, with the first Hubble deep field, and then there was many more. There was the, uh, the ultra deep field, the extreme deep field. There's the frontier fields, which were six deep fields. Um, there are, And then there was the goods deep field. So that goes out to about where this line is, somewhere on the order of a billion years or so after the Big Bang. But because JWST is colder, it can see more in the infrared than Hubble can. Remember, the Hubble is primarily in the near infrared. This is going all the way out into the mid infrared. JWST can see way back here, all the way to about 300, <clears throat> excuse me, 400,000 years. I'm sorry. No, uh, the first stars were about, uh, uh, what is that? It says, it says 0.3 billion years, but that would be 300. That doesn't make sense. Because here it says about 400,000 years. So about, let's say, half a billion years later, uh, the first stars and the first galaxies began to form. This is right after the period of reionization. Okay, I won't get into that right now. But the uh, the first stars and the first galaxies are here. Webb will have the a big enough mirror, a big enough primary mirror, that it can resolve those galaxies out to those wave, those wavelengths, I'm sorry, those red shifts. So, like I said, we're going to see the very first stars that ever shined in the universe. And we will see directly with Hub, with uh, JWST the very first galaxies that formed from those very first stars directly. And we will be able to learn a lot about the early universe. This is a period of time we do not know anything about. Um, we, they will be able to give us clues and insight into the dark ages. This was a period before the stars formed and the wall, the absolute furthest back we can see in the universe is the cosmic microwave background at about 300,000 years after the big bang. That is a wall we cannot get past for laws of physics reasons. But for now, this is pretty good to be able to see this far back. And because as I told you, these galaxies, these stars, have been redshifted into the infrared. This region, the cosmic microwave background, has been redshifted into the microwave region of the spectrum. So we don't need a space telescope to, well, we do actually, to, to see it accurately. A, a space to see the, the cosmic microwave background um, is seen uh, at the microwave wave wavelengths and JWST is in the infrared. So this is why, this little bracket right here, the first galaxies, the first stars, all of this is going to be the realm of James Webb Space Telescope. That's another big thing that it can do that Hubble can't. And finally, let me point out the one that I'm, I'm most excited about is the primary mirror of, Hubble, of JWST will be six and a half meters, enough that it will be able to resolve. I'm going to say this again. It will be able to resolve exoplanets, the disks of planets around other stars in our galaxy. We can't do that right now. We can only see these exoplanets indirectly by looking at them via the transit method or the radio velocity method or with microlensing, but we cannot see these the light that is reflected off of a star that goes into our uh, eyeballs. We have no ability to see that right now because the host star, 
is so bright compared to the reflected light from the planet, we can't see it. Well, as I'll talk about on Thursday, when I talk about the instrumentation, I'll talk about it a little bit here, actually. Uh, in the, in the There's an instrument on board JWST called NearSpec, the Near Infrared Spectrometer. And it has on board the ability to image the light that comes from a reflected planet or from the light that has traveled from the star through the atmosphere of, a pla of an exoplanet and onto the detector. It can measure and see the compounds that are in those light photons that come from the exoplanet. And that means that we can detect what chemicals are in the atmosphere. First of all, we can detect if there's even an atmosphere. We can't even do that right now. Is there an atmosphere around that planet? We don't know. They have some tricky ways of inferring the existence of, a, of, a, of an atmosphere, but we can't measure it directly. We can look at the spectrum of a star, see some things in that in that spectra, and say, "Oh, some of these might some of these lines might be from um, might be from." the atmosphere of a planet, but they have to sort of tease all that out, uh, separate that from the overall spectrum of the star. We'll be able to do that directly because we'll be able to block out the light from the star itself. On near spec, are all it's covered with shutters. Every pixel has above it a shutter that opens and closes. And you can open and close each one of those shutters at your will, whatever you want. So if there's a bright star in your field of view and there's a planet off to the side, but you can't see because the star's so bright, you can close those shutters above the pixels where the star is, block that light out. And there, lo and behold, you will see the exoplanet sitting there. And the diameter of the primary mirror on JWST is large enough that it will be able to resolve the disk of some of these exoplanets depending on their distance. But all these will be in the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way. So we'll have the ability to see the very first stars that ever shine, the very first galaxies that ever form from those stars. We'll be able to see exoplanets directly. We'll be able to measure whether or not they have any atmospheres. And if they do have an atmosphere, what's in it? Because the spectrometer is going to be able to teach us that. Wow. Okay. Hubble can do none of that. Okay. So uh, all it can do. Hubble is look at the star's brightness and see a dip in brightness if it wants to, but nobody wants to use Hubble time for that because it's too expensive, first of all, to use Hubble to stare at a star and watch it get bright and dim again. Uh, so they don't do it that way. They do that stuff on the ground. So Hubble doesn't even look at exoplanets right now, uh, other than maybe characterizing some of the things with um, with the STIS, which is the uh, spect the spectrometer that they ha that it has. Uh, itself on there. But again, it can't tease out the details of the planet itself. So that's another big difference between HST and JWST. So, um, wow. Okay. I went a little bit longer than I thought. I need to get to your comments and questions here. <clears throat> Who wins JWST versus HST? Well, it's not about that. <laughs> um, if I don't think there's a person watching this that thinks that Hubble was a waste of time. But I bet you you're not old enough to remember when it was first launched and how it was vilified. Much like what we're hearing now with the James Webb Space Telescope. Hubble was launched in 1990 with spherical aberration, for God's sakes. Uh, <laughs> that's like telescope making mistake 101, right? You don't, spherical aberration is like the easiest thing to not have in your mirror. Now, for those of you who don't know, Hubble is called an RC telescope, which is a Ritchie Cretien design. Let's see, here it is. This is Hubble, and it's basically two hyperbolic curves. On this side is the primary mirror, and this is the secondary mirror. This, this is what Hubble is. And um, it is uh it had spherical aberration in it. Now, it's not easy to make a hyperbolic surface. I'll give them that. I mean, Perkin Elmer built this mirror and screwed it up. It had spherical aberration, which meant that it couldn't focus. The two, the two surfaces were just not able to achieve any kind of focus. So a couple of years later with Nick, I think it was, what was it called? Nick Moth? No, 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 no. 
Oh, shoot. There was a name for it. I forgot the name of the glasses they put on Hubble. They've since taken those off. But um, it's uh, they fixed it, and the rest is history, right? So that's another reason why you got to, I mean, that's not NASA's, well, it is NASA's fault, I guess. You have, they were they oversaw Perk and Elmer. But these contractors, man, they do, they, my problem is with them. You know, they, they Northrop Grumman screwed the pooch a couple of times in this project, and NASA called him to task. Um, and, of course, Rockwell International built Hubble, uh, and they were, and Perk and Elmer built the mirror, the subcontractor. Um, but that was a big deal. I mean, you know, NASA took a big hit on that, uh, public relations-wise. It wasn't as big a deal as this is, though. Thomas Zerbuchen has said, leader of the science directorate, that if anything happens to the James Webb Space Telescope, it will set NASA's science directorate back 20 years. Um, and I, so there's a lot on the line here. Um, that means, remember I told you, NASA split up into two parts, the human side and the, the, the science directorate side. The science directorate side affects everything from Mars rovers all the way to uh, space telescopes. And I agree. I think he's right. It's going to be such, they will have a, it will be a, a failure of NASA at a level that they've never experienced before. And I don't think this is going to happen to them, but like I said, you know, this, this, this organization has got balls. I mean, they, you know, this, this is a ballsy move with NASA. Talk about putting all your eggs in one basket, go big, go home. You hear all this crap all the time from people talking a big, talking a big stink about, you know, uh, being bravado. NASA's putting its money where its mouth is. It's going, all right, man, we're going to build the world's most complicated, most biggest, most everything space telescope. We're going to launch it and put it up there all in one shot. And then we're going to do all these complicated things. We're going to take a month to unfold it. We're going to put it way out a million miles away where we have no hope of, of repairing it, at least not in the short term. And uh, we're going to just do this, man. And let's learn about the universe. Let's get this done. <laughs> so so th there's a lot on the line here. And I'm I'm impressed by, by having, I mean, I, I just can't say enough good things about NASA at this point. Yes, there have been drop, you know, some some missteps along the way. Um, and I've got no respect for North of Grumman um, and the way they've handled this mission. They just use it as pretty to them. Eight, nine, eight, nine billion dollars is is, you know, that's um, that's a toilet on an aircraft carrier to them. They, they don't you know, they don't even think that this is a big amount of money uh, to be spent. So I tried to compare the two. Um, the two missions dollar wise, I think I, 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 maybe I mentioned this early in the, in this, in the stream, but I'll do it again real quick. In 2020 dollars, I think it cost um, $3 million, $3 billion to build and launch this, the Hubble space telescope. That's a lot of money, quite a bit. I'm not trying to downplay that. Uh, the entire mission from 1990 to now has cost over 13 billion. That includes five servicing missions and operations of the of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the JWST has cost nine billion to build. They're thinking another billion to operate for five years. The nominal mission length is five years for JWST. It is limited by the hydrazine on board. So what? That's the jets that point it, uh, move it around. Uh, when that runs out, that's it. They, they they'll still. I the, even then though, they'll still be able to use JWST because remember when Kepler went down and one of the reaction wheels didn't work anymore, and they still found a way to use pressure from the sun of all things as one of the reaction wheels to keep Kepler pointed along the ecliptic uh, plane of the orbit that it was in, um, in in an accurate enough way that they could still do science with it. So even without a reaction wheel and hydrazine, they ran out of fuel too, uh, they were still able to use it well past its mission. So they got a lot of money out of Kepler. I still think even without hydrazine, they would find a way. They have a momentum flap on the back of this thing. Maybe they can use it to point. I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if they figured out a way to uh, to still keep it alive even without hydrazine. Now, it's technically possible. We're using a robotic servicing spacecraft that don't exist yet, but might in um, in five years or 10, anomaly, is they, they'll probably go as much as 10 if they're judicious in their use of the fuel. Um, 
to go out and refill the thing with gas and, uh, and, and make it last even longer. Maybe put in a couple more gyros. I don't know. Um, but, uh, it's possible it's designed in such a way that that can be done. JWST is so who knows, maybe, right. We need to start supporting these companies that are trying to do this there. I need to, I wish I could give you names of the companies. I've talked to some of them on hangouts many times in the past, but they, they are, they're working on satellites that will go up and repair satellites, deorbit them safely, move them to higher orbits, all of this stuff, that kind of work really needs to step it up because then we could we can move HST up a little bit higher so it doesn't crash and burn in, in the mid-2030s. We could go and refuel JWST when it runs out of hydrazine. So these are all things I think are very important. With that capability, then the sky's the limit, literally, for JWST in terms of being able to operate on that. Gone are the days, though. This will be the last one. Mark my words. Gone are the days of these large, great observatory missions on this scale. We won't see anything like this in our lifetimes. This launch, this um, this uh, the scale of mission and the attempt that NASA has put forth. Uh, if it's successful, it'll be a huge feather in its cap. We all expect it to be successful, but the um, the uh, uh, risks are 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 pretty are pretty great. And so I think going forward. Everybody, the the the, uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, um, the inter the, uh, the uh, International Astronomical Union, all of the world's astronomers want to see a, a, another way of getting these things built. I don't think we'll see Louvoir. Louvoir is this giant, even bigger JWS, JWST. Um, I think we'll see smaller versions that maybe can be put together into a big telescope, but not like this. We won't see this again in our lifetime. So. This is it. It's exciting. All right. Um, I want to get to a question from Julian uh, that's related to this, and I'll get to the chat. Sorry I'm taking so long, folks. This is There's a lot to talk about here. Um, Julian, my friend from Canada, uh, sent me an email. Let me read it to you here. Don't worry, Julian. I won't give you, you know, any information. But he goes, do you think um, that in the near future, optical engineers might be able to make a rough commercial version of JWST mirror for amateur reflector scopes? Um, and what in the way of J JWST camera technology might be commercialized uh, for amateur use, if at all? And so the first thing I want to do is I want I, I pointed him to this. Um, this is um, a company called SpaceFab and uh, SpaceFab.us. You can go there and see this. They are building the world's first app-controlled space telescope. They plan to launch in 2023. And they're going to, if you can afford time on this uh, uh, telescope, you can take images with it. It's 20 inches. It's built from a CubeSat. And they say it's launching in 2023. This is a new website, and I noticed here, this is interesting, ultraviolet imaging is one of the things that you'll be able to get from this as a service. So if you go over here to, to store, <laughs> one of the things you can do is purchase telescope time. And the telescope time will be $50 a minute uh, for astronomical observations, $250 a square meter uh, if you want to look at things on the ground. Um, so this is being built. And this is a private company, and the, and you will get access to it. Uh, SpaceFab is. Um, I'm was skeptical at first when I first heard about it a couple of years ago, um, mostly because of this. I I worry that they're going to let people do ground observations. Oops, that's not good. Um, I worry that they're going to, maybe that's, maybe that's a sign of things to come. Uh, getting ground observations might not be possible because I can't imagine any government, including ours, letting people image the earth that, in ways that they aren't in control of. So, um, so that is, uh, <laughs> that's coming up though. Uh, they say you can take space selfies, whatever that means. And um, you have it on, it's on an app. You just download it and you type in, I want this many minutes of observations of say, I don't know, the Horsehead Nebula or the Orion Nebula or Crab Nebula, Eagle Nebula, and you can get your own data right there, right there for $50 a minute. Um, so that's coming. That's So that is not so much a, a tech uh, spinoff from JWST as much as it is a tech spinoff of 
space telescopes in general, between NASA's experience with CubeSats, uh, with, with Spitzer, Kepler, uh, uh, and Herschel, and um, that wasn't NASA, but still, uh, uh, and all the space telescopes that are out there, this has become a lot more affordable. So look into space fab, that's one thing. And, other, and, and so for amateurs out there, the one spinoff that I could think of, and, and Julian, when I emailed you back, I didn't say this because I thought about it afterward. Um, because the JWST is an infrared scope, there's not a lot of things that can be done on the ground with it. Uh, you can't, we can't see the infrared on the ground in the wavelengths that JWST is going to be looking at. That's why it's going into space. So there's not a lot of spinoffs from the detector technology except that near-spec shutter thing I was telling you about. Remember those, I need to find a picture of this shutters. Um, those shutters are, um, are, I think, will will trickle down and make their way into amateur CCD cameras. Imagine you bought a camera from, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Stick or, or uh, what are the different, I'm, I'm, drawing, I'm drawing a blank now um, on all the different manufacturers for, uh, just go to OPT's website and anything you see on there, all those manufacturers of cameras. Um, I'm not an imager, so I don't I don't keep up on those. But the um, uh, imagine buying one of those cameras with the ability to block out individual pixels on your camera. I think that's coming down to amateur scopes. Um, many times, the dynamic range of the sky is 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 very very high. You have a bright bright star. The trapezium is a good example in the Orion Nebula. If you're looking at the Orion Nebula, the brightest thing in it right now is those four stars that are in the trapezium. They're stars that are being born, brand new stars, but they're very, very bright. And when you image the Orion Nebula, you, you, you generally get those really uh, saturated if you want to see surrounding detail all around you. But imagine that you could block them out and only them, right? The pixels that only cover those stars and Im image the surrounding area all in one shot. That's coming. And that's because that's directly related from the James Webb Space Telescope uh, micro shutter array. So that's a spinoff that I think will happen too, Julian. So look for that. Um, okay, let me get a couple of these. Uh, wow, there's a lot of, thank you guys for watching, by the way, and supporting this. This is, this is amazing. This is a lot of fun. Um, so let's see, <laughs> Ray is commenting. Um, they'll be launching little robots in Iron Man suits. <laughs> Don't you wish those happen? I would I would love those. I would think that would be great. Um, uh, is there really no chance of repairing the telescope? 1.6 million is a big distance, but only it's only two times the trip to the moon and back. Um, I didn't say there's no chance. There's no plan for it. Um, this thing's going to get built, launched, and sent to L2 this year and work for five years, hopefully 10, uh, if they can keep everything going well. And in the meantime, and that's it, there's, the, what else do we have? You know, we haven't built anything else. So we've got to have the capability. Uh, re repair is, I think, one of the biggest growth industries in, in space that you're going to see right now, because there is a huge need to not only clear away space junk, but to repair what's already up there or move it around uh, and improve it. And I think that's a really cost-effective thing to be able to do to your space. If, you've got, if you're a company, let's say you're DirecTV, I don't know what they would charge for this, but let's say you're DirecTV and you're uh, wanting one of your satellites fixed instead of launching a whole other one, that, that could buy, be a lot cheaper right? Uh, you don't necessarily need to launch on an entirely new satellite. Um, Starlink, which has got tens of thousands uh, on <laughs> on the way, um, they just deorbit them and replace them uh, as they wear out. Um, but what if they could be repaired? You know, would that be a better way to go? Um, I think over time that becomes more cost effective. So right now there's no chance for JWST to be repaired, but maybe in five years it will be. I mean, this isn't the way, the pace at which we're doing things is pretty fast these days in space. So maybe um, look it up and support those companies that are trying to do this kind of thing. Um, uh, this is from um, Neil. Have they ever sent anything to L2 to see if it will survive? Dude, the L2 is crowded. Uh, lots of things are at L2 right now. Um, I mentioned Herschel. The Herschel Space Telescope was a telescope that was smaller than JWST, but it was also infrared. Uh, it's out at the L2 point. Um, they're sending everything out there. Uh, it's a very desirable place to put things. The L1 point is also a desirable place to put things. The SOHO 
spacecraft from NASA is sitting out there looking at the sun uh, from the L1 point and has been doing it since 1995. So there's an example of a space telescope that has been operating with no repairs a million miles away. So we can do this. We can do it. I don't know the details of how SOHO points, but keep in mind, SOHO is designed to look only at the sun. It is not designed to move around and point at all kinds of other things. So it probably doesn't have the same fuel requirements. I, I, I'm putting this off the top of my head, so I don't know for sure. Um, but it's been out there work. It's still working right now. You can go to soho.nascom.com, I think, or whatever it is. I think the, the, anyway, they're still today taking data in variety of wavelengths, including two coronagraphs, taking a look at the, at the, at the solar Corona. So, um, 25 plus years, it's been up working a million miles away from earth. We've got a lot of experience doing this, uh, in addition to Hubble. So they all one point's another good place to go. Uh, Patrick is commenting, um, the next generation of space telescopes will have to be assembled in space, avoiding the expense of a launch capable design as well as a launch vehicle will be the only way. Yeah. I'll talk about this more on Thursday, but the, <laughs> there's, uh, there's hundreds of places where JWST is going to fail. But um, the two big scary ones are going to be launch, uh, getting it up into space, and the fairings that come out immediately after. Uh, then there's going to be, within about uh, a few hours after launch, a, um, a rocket firing to get it out to L2. Um, the rocket launch itself is, is quite dangerous and is obviously a single point of failure if it blows up. Um, so. Yeah, the ability to be able to assemble these things in space will be important. Louvoir, however, was not designed to be sent in space. Louvoir was designed to be put in a rocket just like Webb was. It was just going to be folded up even more um, and uh, sent out that way. So, But I agree. I think we should be building these things in space. Uh, let's see, Aina, uh, don't you think that Louvoir could be doable if SpaceX, SpaceX Starship is successful? Um, sure. But again, this is another one of those missions where you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And I think people are getting a little risk averse to this. I mean, I don't think there's anybody better at NASA at managing risk, but this may be, it may be time to revisit how we're doing this, right? Especially, we'll see how experienced with JWST goes, but yeah, I mean, Starship is certainly capable of doing it. It's got the lift, uh, and the, and the cost would be lower. Um, I don't know what this launch is costing. Uh, from ESA, I think it's probably in the billion dollar range. So that's quite a bit more than what SpaceX generally charges, which is in the hundred to two hundred million dollar range. Um, so I don't know. I mean, but yes, um, Louvoir can be doable. But it's but it's not just the launch that's got people concerned. It's this giant, uh, the, you know, what, build all these gigantic observatories where just about anything can go wrong. And is there another way to do this? Can we maybe build a couple of billion dollar? space telescopes instead of one ten billion dollar space telescope right that and that's what the last decadal survey was recommending let's come up with a new way to do this that was the number one priority by the way of the decadal survey let they didn't pick any missions it said let's redesign how we're doing this uh these great observatories let's come up with another one so um did i see the discord or did i see horsehead in discord let me let me go look at Discord. Where is it? Uh, let me see here. Here's my Discord server. Oh, and let's see. Where's Discord? Where did you put it? I don't see it. I see I see some memes. And I see a, another meme. But I don't I don't see the uh, did you post it recently or is this something that um, is older? So I did. I, anyway, I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't see it. Um, Cryptolicious. Hello. It's good to see you again. It makes sense to send and park a service drone at L2. Maybe a few robotic arms and some tools and a fuel tank. You can be sure that's on the way, man. Uh, you can be sure that's happening. Um, and so I, <clears throat> I think that's probably in, in the in the works. The, the L2 is going to be a shipyard so to speak of space telescopes after a while it's going to have a lot of stuff out there in it uh you know when apophis comes through in 2029 um <clears throat> the um 
uh, what what some people want to do is uh, oh there it is okay okay hang on just I'll show that in just a second what a lot of, what what's, what a lot of astronomers want to do is they want to launch a CubeSat type uh, space telescope rocket on a rocket on a single stage rocket up above earth and wait for apophis to come through and then they want to follow it along uh to uh to measure it as it flies by um that kind of thing i think is going to become more commonplace where we put things up in space and we wait for events to happen uh or we we do repairs i think we'll to me, I'm just as excited of, of robotic, the robotic future of space exploration as I am with the human side of it. I think humans should be in space. I think we should go to the moon, maybe Mars eventually. I don't, I mean, I, I think that's important that we should do it. I don't think we're ever going to terraform Mars. I don't think we're ever going to live there forever uh, and be in space in a really big way uh, without a lot of... Um, trade-offs in terms of our quality of life up in space because it's just going to be very unhealthy for us but I do, I do think we should do it but the robotic part of it this i mean there's no limits on what we can do in robotic exploration of space we can go to jupiter without worrying about you know sending people on a five-year mission there right we can go right there and uh, send our probes land on it walk around and do all of the stuff we need to do to explore these things without physically being there I think that that just that to me is a very exciting possibility. Robotic spacecraft repairing other spacecraft, uh, even building things up in space. All of this stuff is very exciting to me. Just as exciting as the human part of it, if not more so in many ways. Uh, Raj, good to see you again. I have uh, added electric pulsion, et cetera, to JWST. Uh, so if it breaks, NASA can bring it back to Earth to be repaired. Yeah, but see, that's what's called scope creep. <laughs> this thing was already costing $10 billion. You want to add electric propulsion to it, um, then you're looking at more more costs. So um, again, that's like putting more and more stuff into this one basket is quite a bit. Um, so let's see. Uh, would be cool. This is from Bert. Would be cool to get a, a, a the maintenance job of JWST to just stay there, look into space, watch intergalactic TV channels. That's right. Just you mean on the telescope, a little room where you sit there and wow, that would be scary. I think for me, I don't think I'd want that job. Aaron uh, is the dist it's the distance mainly. It's like four times further than the moon. However, maybe SpaceX will have tech to make it out there. You talking about going to the L two point? Yeah. Um, uh, and Ray is like, of course they'll refuel it. In 10 years' time, they'll send more fuel and a little maintenance robot to keep things working. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, well, that's not that's not so far away. Five, 10 years, I think they'll have it done too. Um, and then Hans wants a telescope on the far side of the moon. That's coming, I think. NASA's already, do you know that NASA has plans to put cell phone service on the moon? They, I think Nokia is working on that. Can you believe that? I'm not making that up. Cell phone service on the moon. So Steve is commenting, uh, maybe 10 years. Uh, if something fails, possibly private company could be called upon to do repairs on robotic astronauts heading out there. Could this not be? Absolutely. It is a plausible possibility for sure, Steve. Absolutely. Um, Bert is commenting, I can't sleep when a new website I've worked on goes online. I can't imagine having my hands on something where the whole country, the whole world will shit on me <laughs> if something goes wrong. You know, I can't, I don't, I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. There are, I do not, there, um, for some reason, because I'm old, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but the project manager is out there right now whose responsibility it is to, um, to get JWST off the ground, I would not want his job right now. I just would not want it. Uh, the stress would be crazy. Think about it. People have been working on this telescope for 20 years. Careers have come and gone in the time that this telescope has been being, being built. Um, it's, it's crazy. It's the, the, the amount of time that this is going on uh, that's passed here. Um, Eric is saying a uh, uh, billion dollar service commission to double the lifespan would, lifespan would still be cost effective. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. Um, John, uh, it, of course, they will find a way to service JWST. Orion is supposed to be able to go to Mars, but they can't go to JST to service it. I know. I, I agree. I think they will. Um, they will. Um, 
How much push will JWST get from the sun? So that's a good question. Actually, quite a bit. Um, the momentum of the solar wind is such that they had to install a momentum flap on the back of it. Um, let's see if I can show it to you. Uh, there is... All right, so it, it's a, this is a really cool website, by the way. Um, this is web, this is jwc.nasa.gov. This is the... Um, this is the deployment sequence. You can click on any of these deployment things to see when, what's going to happen. Sometimes they have a video uh, to show uh, on what it is. But there, what I want to show you is there is a momentum flap. Um, that's the deployable tower. Here it is. The F momentum flap. There it sits in the bottom. There's a video. So let's take a look. That flap right there. So it sits at the end of the solar uh, uh, sun shield and uh, is it's like a rudder. You can you can uh, twist it and turn it uh, in response to the solar wind pressure. Uh, this is to reduce torque on the spacecraft itself and um, sort of steer it into the solar wind. So it works a lot like a rudder. It's very reflective so that it can reflect photons from the from the solar wind, but it's mostly just the radiation pressure uh, that it will react to. So um, that, that momentum flap is designed to uh, offset some of the solar pressure and impinges on the large, that impinges on the large sun shield. Uh, use of a momentum flap helps to minimize fuel usage during the mission. After releasing hold down devices, a spring drives the rotation of the app aft flap to its final position. I would go here, guys, because not only do you get a countdown of the mission itself, uh, which is right there, but you also get to do this explore deployments. And here you can click on the entire thing that is being deployed uh, each step along the way. Um, the thing I did not know when I was reading this is um, that they will launch the, the the spacecraft up um, and it will have, let's see if I can find out where it says that. The Ariane 5 launch vehicle provides thrust for roughly 26 minutes after liftoff from French Guiana. The first stage fires cons consumes its fuel, cuts off and separates. Next, the second upper stage fires, giving Webb its final push up and away from the Earth's gravity and onto a trajectory towards its L2 orbit. Um, the upper stage completes its burn, cuts off and separates. Webb is released from Ariane 5 and is flying on its own in a fully stowed state. But that's not what I wanted to read. Where is it? Um, that's not it. Uh, it's a solar array. That's got to happen. Ah, here it is. Um, this burn, this is the first mid uh, course correction that it does. Uh, this burn fine tunes Webb's trajectory after launch. Uh, the, Webb's, the Webb Space Telescope is launched on a direct path to an orbit around this L2 point, but it needs to make its own mid course correction to get there. That's by design because if Webb gets too much thrust from the Ariane rocket, it can turn around, uh, it can't turn around to thrust back toward Earth because that would directly expose its telescope optics and structure to the sun. So when rockets, oh, you can't really see me because I've got this thing in the way, but when rockets um, when rockets slow down, they generally have to flip over and fire a retro rocket to slow down. You can't do that with James Webb because it would that would point it toward the sun. So, they, they, so what they're doing instead, uh, Webb will... Uh, uh, that would overheat them and it, and it aborts the science mission before it even begins. So it can't turn around. Therefore, Webb gets an intentional slight underburn from the Ariane rocket. So it doesn't get its full thrust that it needs to get there. And it uses its own small thrusters and onboard propellant to make up the difference. So I thought that was interesting. Um, not only uh, will uh, Ariane, so the Ariane rocket will get it up there, but not enough to get it to L2. It needs a further it needs a it needs to further uh, correct itself using its own onboard rockets to get to L two because it, it it they they can't just keep pushing it up with the rocket it'll go too fast and they'll have to turn around and slow down they can't do that with Webb I thought that was interesting I didn't I didn't know that 
So, um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's something I did not know. There are reaction wheels on JWST, um, but the hydrazine thrusters are more toward getting the gross slewing done. Okay. Who got the plan with 300 plus unrecoverable failure points and cost of tens of billions and whose failure would set NASA back a decade and said, yeah, brilliant plan. Go for it, dude. I mean, this take you, do you have the balls for this? I don't think so. <laughs> this takes some cojones. Okay. NASA, NASA's got this, you know, they've, they, they've done harder things before. So I'm not worried. NASA's got this 300 plus unrecoverable single points of failure. Yeah, man, bring it, bring it. NASA, I don't know how they manage risk, but they do have a way of doing it. And, they, and they've, they've eliminated all the unacceptable risks. And now what's left are these acceptable risks. And these are ones that they think they've mitigated throughout all of this. So, I mean, I see your point. Why do something so risky, you know, and cost so much money? Why do it this way? And I think NASA is learning that lesson. Certainly the astronomer community has learned this lesson. They don't want to always be put in this position. But you got to admire the guts. I mean, you just, I mean, come on, man. This is, <laughs> this is exciting stuff, right? You're probably never going to sit around and go, you know what, I'm going to do this. Yeah, man, I can do it. You don't have the balls for it. But these guys do. NASA does. So hats off to them, man. Hats off to them. And if it fails, you know, Every time I have so many friends who think big and they're always telling me go big or go home or, you you know, you gotta, you gotta go for the, the gusto or, you know, you always have to reach for this, you know, re do the hard stuff. You know, if, is that just bravado? Because this is putting your money where your mouth is, right? It's easy to sit here and say, well, you gotta go big or go home, but it's another to do it. And very, very few people actually do it. Um, I don't really think much of Elon Musk, but you got to hand it to his. He's got another big set of balls, that guy. So, I mean, you know, he's, uh, you know, things get done or they don't get done. If it blows up, we're all going to be devastated for sure. But do we really think we shouldn't have tried this at all? Is that really going to be the response to this? Is that right? I don't know. I don't want it to be. I don't want this to be uh, the way we look at things. I don't want it to be so risk averse that we don't try anything amazing. So uh, they do, Ray. I know. I know. I hear you. I'm, I'm with you on a lot of this stuff. Okay. I get it. That NASA has screwed up quite a bit of things too. And if they screw up this, then it gets screwed up. But I, I really think it's worth doing. I really. Um, all right, so let's see here. Uh, actually, what may, that makes for a good question. Considering how expensive Hubble is right now, what are the implications for JWST and researcher access? Well, it turns out people don't pay for Hubble time. That's paid for by the program. The, the Hubble Space Telescope program pays for Hubble time. What you pay for is the cost of the proposals and dealing with the data uh, with uh, in your institution. Um, so Hubble Space Telescope time doesn't actually cost you dollars. I think the same is true for JWST. So um, I don't see why they would change it. It's operated the same way. It's, it's the same same institute, Space Telescope Science Institute is still operating it. So um, it, as far as access to researchers, they're not just going to let anybody use it. And by that, I mean, they're not going to let anybody without a good science question use it. I think any researcher can get access to the James Webb Space Telescope if they have a good reason for using it. Keep in mind, the Hubble Space Telescope gets tens of thousands more proposals than they ever would have time to honor. So you need to have, the, so that means the best of the best science gets picked to use these instrumentation. With JWST, it's gonna be even worse, right? Because you're gonna have an even bigger group of people who want to use the, the web space telescope. So you need to have, if you want access to web, you're going to need to have a damn good reason for using it. And I think that'll, and that's, I think I've, I've seen people, I've talked to people on the time allocation committee for Hubble and they're reasonable people. 
they, you know, they don't want, they don't, I mean, they're humans, but I don't think they have a lot of personal gripes against. They're not going to say, oh, I'm not letting that guy in because he doesn't have this or that affiliation. Uh, they tend to look strictly at the science use case that wants to use the Hubble for, and they make their decision based on, and then they have to rank it because everybody can have a good science case, but there's only so many orbits in a year to allocate to observations. So you only have to, you can only pick a subset of what you have, even if they all have good science cases. So if you really want more access to space telescopes for researchers, build more space telescopes. That's what that's the case for. Um, but this is going to be oversubscribed this entire lifetime. It, the, the first cycle has already been decided um, of JWST. The first year of observations have already been set up. Uh, you can go to the Space Telescope Science Institute website and look at cycle one, I think, for um, for JWST and see what's going to be uh, observed. So, so and uh, uh, Launchpad just commented, Christian just commented, the JHST and JWST proposals are now double blind, meaning that, you know, they're looking at the proposal itself without, with as few biases as possible. So, um, so yeah. Um, all right. A um, couple more and then I've got to go. My goodness, this is taking a while. I'm sorry this is taking so long, guys. Niels is commenting, I think NASA changed how they'd make a mirror after that incident since a calibration laser was off a bit because some paint was chipped off a support frame for the whole getup. Yeah, lessons were learned. You're talking about Hubble. Yeah. Um, uh, so. All right. So I think I will gonna have to go there folks i'm um sorry guys i i i i want to thank you all first of all for joining this hangout this is like way more uh people than i thought would show up so i'm glad you guys are here i'll be back on thursday where we're going to get centered we're going to be mindful we're going to calm ourselves <laughs> and get ready for this launch um we're going to look at you know all of the things that, that nasa has done uh, to get us to this point, what can we expect from James Webb? We're going to make ourselves feel better about the stresses involved. We're going to try to loosen these kegel muscles <laughs> so that we aren't always puckering our sphincters all day long uh, because it is an exciting time. And let's try and remember that. Let's remember that this is scientific discovery at its best. And we uh, are we are able to be a part of it. We're able to be here. And even if the thing blows up, even if we still have made progress. I know it won't seem like it, but these hard problems teach us more, and especially during failure, than they do uh, during our successes. So there's a lot to be learned here, no matter what happens. I personally, um, through no other reason than I, that I know of my experience with NASA, and I trust their uh, risk management abilities, um, that this thing's going to fly. This thing's going to fly and it's going to deploy. And we're going to start looking at the very first stars in the universe within a few months. And it's a great time to be a part of this. And let's hang on to that. Uh, the human condition, the human exploration, the endeavors that we embark on define who we are. And if we're not doing these great things, then what are we? And what are we trying to do? Uh, why are we, are we just taking up space? You know, are we just angry at each other? We want to fight all the time. We want to have wars or do we want to strive for knowledge and greatness in different ways? And this is a valorous effort uh, on, on NASA's part and ESA's part and the Canadian Space Agency and all the people who've been involved, all the different collaborations that are out there. Careers have been dedicated to this. Everybody wants it to succeed. And so we're going to take a look at that on Thursday. And I hope that you will join me and uh, then we'll get together early Friday morning and watch this thing go. All right, folks, thank you all so very, very much for joining me today. I'll see you guys on Thursday. And as always, keep looking up. <laughs>